Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take the global stories that made it to the front pages of our national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Euro University, joining us from Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. All right, so we'll be starting with The Guardian this morning, and it says FX execution hitches threaten food waiver policy as farmers kick. Now, um, we understand that there's a 150-day window um, for certain import duties to be waived off for farmers um, because we're trying to ensure that there's some level of food security, especially with the inflation and scarcity that we've seen um, in recent times. But out of the 150 days, over a month has gone past. It still hasn't been implemented or executed, executed the way it's supposed to be. And now farmers are, are saying, you know, these policies, they just don't work. And there are some hitches at the moment. I would like to get your take on this, please. Yeah, you see, um, uh, this policy, uh, last week when we did it um, on the same issue, the, the, yeah. the problem was that the government was still at the planning stage mm. and that uh, the custom is unaware of who and who are supposed to be involved. Now there is a major issue, bigger than all those ones, that, uh, you know, we are to import uh, the products or the food. But uh, we are not going to import it in Naira. So it is going to be in foreign exchange, I mean, in foreign currency. And now the issue of foreign exchange is a major stumbling block. Uh, how will the uh, farmers or whoever is involved will get the necessary foreign exchange to buy the food items? That is a major problem. And um, secondly, even if it is available, uh, even if the foreign exchange is made available to the people who are involved, the issue is at uh, what amount. If uh, it is going to be the same foreign exchange, let's say the value of Naira versus dollar, you know, we are just shifting the, in the problem because we are going to import it in dollars mm -hmm. and now you convert it to Naira and it will be very expensive. So I think this issue of uh, FX is what the farmers are saying that the government has to look at it. Otherwise, the whole uh, uh, idea will be dead because you don't expect people to go and buy in Naira. Hmm. So what do you think they should be doing right now, especially if we're trying to combat food insecurity? Um, I was speaking to someone yesterday, she's a farmer, and she was just talking about the scarcity right now. That maybe soon there might be plenty, but still there will be scarcity if we do not tackle insecurity. Because most of these farmers cannot go to their farms. Um, they've been taken over by terrorists. So I know that the, you know, waiving of the import duty is just one measure. And like I always ask, is it sustainable? What happens after the 150 days? So what do you think would be a more sustainable um, policy or a more sustainable measure to combat food insecurity? You see, the, the most sustainable one is for us to uh, create an enabling environment that will uh, enable our farmers to produce, mm. okay? Uh, no matter what, if you are just import, you are just putting temporary measures. And secondly, you are killing uh, your own uh, farming here. So I think what the government ought to do is to look inward to make sure that uh, uh, we are secured, farmers and everybody is secured, so that farmers can go to the farm and farm. And then secondly, that uh, the, you know, the implement and the inputs that the farmers need are also cheap, so that uh, the farmers can use it and uh, you know, produce. And most importantly, the government uh, should come in and uh, take the idea of large-scale farming, either by itself directly or by sponsoring or supporting big farmers to produce. Otherwise, whatever you do uh, is just a temporary measure. And uh, you cannot just import. And look at what we are having. We say we are going to import for 150 days, which is maybe five months or at most six months. 
then what will happen after the six months? Okay, even if you import it, it will not be able to meet the, need, the needs of Nigerians. And then after six months, you don't have that one. And look at the amount of money you are going to ship out in order to purchase food. Nigeria is uh, blazed with uh, you know, abundant, fertile uh, areas. Anywhere you go in Nigeria, uh, you know, they have competitive advantage where they can have uh, you know, a kind of particular uh, food that they can grow in that area. So that is what the government should do. And we shouldn't also look at uh, purely the federal government also. State government have to come in. Even local government have to come in in order to uh, make sure that um, farming uh, is, uh, you know, given uh, adequate attention. Here in Kanu, I uh, said uh, last uh, Friday, we have one town, Tudumwada, and uh, it is known for rice, uh, you know, cultivation. Mm. Most of the people who went to buy food in Tudumwada had to return back because it was unaffordable. There was rice there, but it was unaffordable. Uh, given what the government has been doing with this issue of uh, palliatives, you know, the people are given money, like the governors and this, and they go and buy food there, uh, you know, at high rate. And sometimes even they go to the farms before the uh, harvest, they will buy it there. People are starving, they will buy it from the farmers and then hold it. So you have to look at was to make sure that uh, your food security policy uh, is, uh, you know, realistic. But yeah. the way we are doing it is highly unrealistic. It is a very temporary measure that will not solve any problem. Mm. So talking about um, security, well, there are two um, stories here on The Guardian. It, one says, uh, again, terrorist strike in Kaduna, kidnap um, district head, six others. Another says, two killed in Abuja, um, Shite police clash, bandits kidnap 150 in Sokoto. Um, so we're seeing stories like this. Imagine on just one paper, there are two stories about insecurity. Over 100 and people, uh, on 150 people have been kidnapped. But here is where it, it gets interesting. Um, Okonjo Uwela asked politicians to stop weaponizing insecurity. So now, uh, of course, there's been rumors that most of these politicians are the ones who are even doing these things, who are um, causing chaos, or maybe they're funding um, these terrorists. Now we're seeing someone, a notable figure, someone like Okunjo Iwela, who's saying politicians need to stop weaponizing um, insecurity. Do you think that the politicians really are the ones doing this? And um, why do you think they would even be perpetrating such evil? Isn't, so, isn't Nigeria supposed to be everyone's business, whereby we're supposed to make sure that everyone feels safe and secured? Why is kidnapping, why is banditry, why is terrorism on a rise? And the people at the helm of affairs are the one that might just be funding it, or maybe they're not even just doing anything about it. Yeah, you see, it's both ways. Um, some who are supposed to take action, they are not taking action uh, on it. Uh, some who are uh, benefiting, and they are the majority because they are cash, uh, they, it, it has become a cash cow for them. So that is why they are sponsoring uh, the thing. Uh, because one will wonder, uh, the amount of money and the amount of people that are being abducted and the ransom that is being paid, mm. where does the money go? You can't expect uh, exchange somewhere in hundreds of millions and mm. you expect them in the forest. You know, that is one thing. Secondly, most of the people who are abducted, when they come out, you know, when they are released, they come out with, uh, you know, as, as parts, I mean, the statement that, look, some people were behind the issue, and the way uh, the kidnappers also get armament and uh, support and all other things show that there are people behind uh, the system. Only that we don't have the political will to go after those people. Like uh, what um, the paper said about uh, Sokoto, you know, that was where the Emma was killed, 
uh, in Gobil. Uh, he was killed. And now, within some few days, uh, some, uh, about 100 and people, 150 people were abducted in the place. And nearby villages, also a number were caught, about uh, 42. So all in all, in the same town, about 192 people were yeah. abducted. And um, about 1,000 cattle were, were arrested. And then about 20,000 farm land you know, was seized by this and that. I mean, they displayed the farmers. Hmm. And uh, what one professor said uh, from Sokoto, he said that, look, some big people, some big shots in the place were able to call uh, the bandits and talk to them, which means they know them. Yeah. Okay. So how can you not take that one as a link and pursue and see how you get to uh, the place? And uh, the son of that uh, uh, Emma that was killed come out and mention even one person that he said he was the one who uh, they told him, the, the, the bandits told him that he paid them five million to abduct them. And uh, now he's denying and the government is doing nothing. Even if it is, you know, uh, suspicious, that is where you can get the person. Just because he's mm -hmm. a member of House of Assembly, call him, interrogate him. The security should squeeze him and find out the reality. So that is why I quite agree with um, uh, Wela that uh, big people, not only politicians, but big people, even within the security uh, agencies, are behind uh, this and other because they turn their way uh, their face away from it and they didn't uh, take active action or because they are directly involved in uh, sponsoring uh, the thing because it is a cash cow for them. Sometimes I just, you know, wonder that, because like you said, they know these people. In fact, when you're trying to abduct 150 people, of course, you're going to be in a convoy of different buses, right? That's the only way you can move them from where you're getting them, um, where you're abducting them to maybe your hideout. So I'm wondering when these people were moving, is it that nobody saw them? Does the security agencies that we have here, what are they doing with, you know, the, the information that they get? Why are they not doing so much about it? Why are they not trying to investigate? Why are they not trying to call some people in? There's just a whole lot. And it begs the question that are they weaponizing this to make sure that there's chaos in the land, one? and then use that to suppress the people. So it seems like we're always just scared for our lives. And then when they do a little thing, um, we applaud them at that point and say, oh, okay, they've done this because we're always going to be scared. So is this a way to subdue the people? Is that the reason why certain people or certain you know, top individuals in Nigeria are weaponizing insecurity? Yeah, it is part of that. Uh, you see, moving moving the people, moving the abductees is not by by bus. They mostly trek. Wow! Uh, imagine what happened in the, in the, in Gobir uh, within the past two uh, few days. One hundred and ninety two people plus one thousand uh, cattle cows. So, you know, it, it, it will take a long time because yeah. they cannot fizzle out in the air, which means there is a, you know, connivance. Uh, the security agents should know, should be able to trace these things and because they have to work. After all, here, in the past one, uh, even we didn't have this problem, if they, they are safe of animals, what they do is to trace the put print and then and go and get the hide out of the people so the, let's alone in this modern time when you have technology that you can be able to trace and uh, beside that you know they talk with the people to the extent that now they have the audacity you know to film uh, what is uh, the process and release it either via TikTok or whatsapp or whatever and all these things which means we cannot be able to trace it at this time of uh, uh, technology. So that is why actually it is real that uh, people are weaponizing this either because they were the, of the money that they can get and because they want to intimidate uh, the victims or because they just want to maintain power, you know, by the time they take a little bit of action here and there.
people would now say, oh, these are the ones that are at our own interest. But it is a very dangerous thing. Actually, uh, it is gradually uh, grounding the whole process, the whole system to a uh, halt. Because uh, once you don't address this issue of uh, uh, security, uh, you don't know what is uh, the fate of even not only democracy, but even the country. Because where you have such crisis and you don't have peace, nothing will take place. Mm. All right, so there's another story here um, that says still, well, now on the nation, if we move over to the nation, still on Okonjo Iwela. So she canvasses, it says Okonjo Iwela canvasses economic policy consistency. Um, there's a writer here that says, uh, VP, that's the vice president, says government committed to rule of law. So uh, one of the things she had spoken about was the fact that we're not really growing the way we should be. Um, we, we're not progressive the way Nigeria should be because of uh, the lack of policy consistency. So it's almost like we introduce this, and before you know it, we move on to another. When another government comes, um, maybe it was this government that introduced this, when another government comes, they just try to roll out their own as well. So there is no consistency that leads to progress. And I know that one question I've always asked is, what is the goal of Niger what is the goal of Nigeria? What is the Nigerian dream? What are we trying what are we striving towards? Right. So if we know that this is what we want, of course we're going to like work towards it and there's gonna be that consistency. But you quite agree with her saying that the reason why um, you know we're not progressing the way we should be is lack of policy consistency, and she's obviously um, canvassing for that. So it says Okonjo Iwela canvasses economic policy consistency. Yeah, it's true. And this is one of the things that um, we have been advocating for long. Uh, you know, one of my areas is policy, public policy, and uh, we started it. And one of the major problems that we identified was uh, Nigerian policy is inconsistency. You know, one, if you have a change of government, okay, no matter how good, how beautiful the policies of the previous government is, uh, the coming incoming government will abandon it and uh, you know start a fresh. And secondly, even the same government uh, will you if you goes over time you see policy inconsistency. Today they will say something, tomorrow they will say another thing. Look at what is happening now. Uh, people, if you look closer, you see the inconsistency. One of the uh, policies of this government is to attract foreign investment, okay? And you know, common sense tell you that investors can, do not play a come in an insecure place. Investors do not come in a very corrupt uh, place. Investors do not come where the cost of production is very high. Investors do not come where there is over taxation and this thing. And so as a result of these things, instead of the investors to come, we see investors, the already existing one, are migrating out of this. So the inconsistency of the policy is such that the government will say one thing on one hand mm. and it will say another on the other. Or today, uh, we have something like uh, take this issue of uh, uh, petroleum subsidy. The government mm -hmm. came out and said that they have removed subsidy. And some agencies of the government are saying the government is paying the, you know, subsidy. Yeah. It's uh, so uh, products. So you see, these are all completing things which are part of the inconsistencies of policy. Because actually, you don't uh, think, people don't think out of the blues and say that we are paying it. Which means the government that... Uh, roll out the policy and say they, they have withdrawn, uh, you know, subsidy. It's the same government now that is subsidizing. So you see which one is which. Is this subsidizing or is it uh, removing the subsidy? So these are the reasons why there is such inconsistency, which actually, um, wherever there is such inconsistency, you can take it like a person walking. He takes one step forward, and two step backwards, how can he reach his own destination? Mm. 
That's a very good question. And of course, if we want to reach our destination, we need to keep taking those steps forward, those steps to progress, really. All right, let's move over to the business NG, and this is more into the finance sector. So the business NG leads with banking, public offers, um, wait five years for returns, experts tell investors. So we know that there's been the whole recapitalization thing, and most of these banks have been, um, you know, giving out shares, offering ordinary shares for a certain amount, and most people are trying to buy, you know, those shares. But five years for returns, I think I saw on social media last week and someone was just talking about how if you had you know if you bought shares for x amount of money um uh, maybe like 10 years ago as of right now it's probably worth next to nothing so if we're looking at our current um you know our current economy right and what the rate is like right now do you think in five years people will actually even get return on investment or rather there will just be a decline in whatever they've invested invested in the first place yeah you see the rate uh, our economy is going uh, i don't think in five uh, five years people will make uh, any gain mm. in fact if they take it uh, cumulatively they will see that they have terribly lost uh, yeah. you know uh, because the value of what you invest now and what is uh, going to happen in the next five years, even in one year. Now, let me give you a short story about this. I, I remember that here in uh, our university at one time, one of the buses, you know, went to this idea and uh, he invested the university monies in terms of, you know, buying shares in the banks. And um, it collapsed. Yeah. I think what he put in there, uh, you know, by the time they come to assist, it was less than 10% of the value of what has been invested. Oh, wow. So I think this is what is going to happen. Yeah, it's going, what is going to happen? Look at how inflation is going. Look at how the Naira is going down. And do you expect when you put your money there and make money? Yeah, I mean, again, when the Naira was uh, about 600 uh, uh, when a dollar was about 600 and something naira now assuming it is that one it's a very simple arithmetic you invest uh, let's say it was one hundred dollars and now that the naira is about 1600 how do you get it means you have already lost the value that you have has already lost i mean uh, been devalued so that is why People now who are wiser, instead of you know going into uh, this uh, area, some of them go into estates. Okay, yeah. they buy land, they buy Real properties. Estate. So that yeah, what they sell them, that one the value is that even if the naira they crash, <laughs> it is going to be the same value at the when you are going to sell it. So that you see, this is what we are saying uh, at the other time a little while ago. That is part of the policy inconsistencies. So that is why we cannot go anywhere with that one. Even if they allow it 10 years at this rate, I think people will not get any return. In fact, they will lose uh, so heavily by investing. Hmm. Well, I think everybody, um, it's important that you do your research. If you're going to be investing in any business whatsoever, it's important that you do your research to be sure that you can get your return on investment when the time comes. All right, we'll take this final story on the business NG. It says inflation, low patronage, um, threaten Nigerian businesses. So, of course, most businesses now are crumbling because of the economy and we're seeing inflation most people do not even have the spending um power anymore I, I don't think most people even just go out to say i want to have a good time or i want to eat because now you're calculating the money that you have the bills that you have to pay and you have to be strategic with how you spend your money so looking at this and how nigerian business are you know faring at the moment what do you think we need to do with our economy to ensure that people now start to flourish the way they used to and start to patronize these businesses yeah you see uh, we have to go back even though the the government is still taking the 
a capitalist approach to the system. Mm. But I think they have to go back to the issue of uh, addressing inflation, which is one of uh, the leading economics in the capitalist area, uh, you know, said, okay, that mm. inflation is the most dangerous threat to economic growth. And mm. this is where we are. And the government should address these things by, I keep, I keep on saying it, retract its own policies. Okay? Already we have, we know what uh, caused these things. So why can't we look at the uh, other way? That is what the uh, public policy is all about. That when you set out uh, to make a policy, the initial policy, you give a time when you evaluate uh, you know, your own policies. And then you take active measures based on the outcome of your policies. And there are three ways by which you do it. One, if the policy is on ground, I mean on course, and it's positive, you continue with it. Two, if the policy is uh, not yielding the result, is giving you negative result, you have to, uh, two other options. Either you modify the policy or you abandon it totally and take another course. And the government, you know, we have so many uh, experts in the government. And these are basic things. But we keep on denying, okay? And uh, look at uh, the effect of inflation on everything. You know, we have just talked about, you know, uh, buying shares. People who don't have the purchasing power to uh, buy it. We are talking of food insecurity. People don't have power to buy it. We are talking of insecurity in the country. And so many things which you generate as a result of this high cost of uh, living. So the government should take that one, uh, give, uh, create a necessary conducive environment by which it can address uh, a, a inflation. And then if it uh, address inflation and uh, insecurity, and uh, the issue of poverty, the issue of hunger, the issue of this thing could be directly addressed. Mm. All right. I think this is a good way to wrap it up here. Thank you so much, sir, for coming. Thank you for always spending your Mondays with me reviewing the papers. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Have a nice day. All right. I've been speaking with yeah. Professor Camille Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Euro University, joining us from Kano. And we've just been taking the global stories that made it to the headlines this morning. We'll go on a short break. When we return, we'll be talking about the DSS. Freedom concerns. Please stay with us.